801, I guess here. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining our session today on the future of security for the Cassandra Query Language Shell, also known as CPLSH. Uh, my name is Artur Nohosen. I'm a product manager here at Amazon Web Services. And with me today to present on the future of security for CPLSH is one of our you know, brilliant engineers, uh, Derek Chen Becker. Derek, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, but before we get started, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat window. Um, we'll try to answer them as we go. If not, we'll save time at the end for Derek to answer any questions. Derek. All right, awesome. Well, uh, I am super excited to be here. This is my second year here at ApacheCon. Um, really excited to, to talk about security. Uh, I am not a security expert, but it's, it's definitely an area that I'm excited about. I see a lot of opportunities there. Um, and I think there are some really interesting uh, aspects of security that we can explore with Cassandra. So um, go ahead and uh, Give you a brief overview here. Um, today, first, we're going to start off with a little bit of a refresher uh, on the current state of Cassandra authentication. Uh, I'm not going to get into authorization. That, that'll maybe turn into next year's talk. We'll see. Um, I'm going to talk about an example use case that, that uh, we've seen um, and how that extends to a more general use case uh, in, Cassandra, uh, in Cassandra and the community in general. Um, we have a, a CEP in uh, that's being worked on for pluggable authentication for CQLSH. And this, this is really talking about um, how we can extend CQLSH to allow for uh, different authenticators than it currently handles. And, and so we'll get into the details on that. Um, and then I wanna, I wanna spend some time at the end talking about how we can improve the overall security posture with CQLSH um, and, and things that we could do to, to help users uh, be more secure by default um, and make it easier for people to secure their systems. So. so let's start by talking about the status quo. Where, where are we today uh, in Cassandra? Um, so Cassandra uh, supports pluggable authentication uh, between the client and the server. Um, this has actually been supported for over a decade. I was looking back through the commits and it, it appears that this was added back in the 0 0.6 release. Um, it's, it's optional authentication. So as part of the uh, protocol interchange between client and server, the server is not required to send an authenticate message, but it can. And if it does, that instructs the client that it needs to do a, an exchange of, of credential information or uh, authentication information. Um, that, that handshake back and forth is based on SASL. Um, I gave a talk last year about, um, how, how we use the SASL interchange to allow for uh, our own security plugin, uh, on, for Amazon key spaces, but more generally, uh, there's some things that we want to explore, uh, in terms of allowing for negotiation, which is something that most SASL implementations provide. If you look at how, say, Postfix uses SASL or uh, web servers use SASL. Um, basically, uh, in Cassandra, the, the server and the client need to agree uh, on, the, on the authenticator that's going to be used. And so the server authenticates the client by sending an authenticate message. And as part of the body of that message, it sends along essentially what's a Java class name of the authentication provider that is configured on the server. And so the client uh, can determine if it supports that authentication mechanism. It will go ahead and respond with an initial response. Uh, in a lot of cases, or in the default case, this is going to be username and password um, that it sends across. Uh, in more sophisticated um, authentication protocols, it might be sending some different material. And then the server has an opportunity to evaluate that response, uh, look at uh, what's going on with the authentication, and it can decide to either uh, further the exchange, so it can send an auth challenge, in which case it sends more information back to the client. The client then needs to send another auth response, and that goes on essentially until the server decides that either authentication has succeeded, in which case it sends an auth success message, or if there's a failure in authentication, it will send back an error with an appropriate message. Um, but the, the, the important thing here is, 
the client server have to agree. If the server is configured for say plain text password authentication and the client has been configured for Kerberos authentication, it won't work and vice versa. So Cassandra is open by default. Uh, it, it comes out of the box with two authenticator implementations. And the, the default configuration, which I show here, is what's called the allow all authenticator. Um, this is somewhat of a special case authenticator um, in that if it's configured, the, uh, the server doesn't actually send the authenticate message at all. Um, essentially, it responds to a startup by message by sending a ready message that says it's ready to accept queries and it doesn't perform any authentication. Um, the other one that it ships with is, is a password authenticator that uses uh, username and password pairs. Um, this is a deliberate choice. Uh, it, it makes it really easy to stand up a cluster and get started with it, testing, working with it, um, and not get bogged down in, in all the details of, of just being able to access the server, let alone uh, tuning and, and creating data, modifying data, et cetera. Uh, it, makes it, it does make it really easy to get started. Um, on the client side, we also have pluggable authentication in the drivers. So all the official drivers support pluggable authentication, um, which basically means that um, for whatever implementation language you have, you have the inner, I'm going to say interface because I come from kind of Java, uh, C++ thing, but you have an interface where um, it, it has the methods needed to handle the exchange between client and server. And the default implementation is plain text auth provider, which ma matches the, the password authenticator on the server side. Um, additionally, you can, you can configure username and password uh, either in the configuration file, which I've shown here, or you can do it programmatically when you set up the, the cluster instance, you can, you can provide credentials. Um, and again, you need to make sure that the, the the class that you're using on the client side agrees with how you've configured the server. Um, so besides the, the plain text auth provider, uh, the, the Cassandra drivers, um, like I said, they support a pluggable implementation. And so there are several open source uh, plugins out there for drivers. Uh, one of them is LDAP. Um, this is actually not a it's technically a driver plugin. This is on the server side. Uh, what it does is you configure the server side with the LDAP plugin. It appears as a, a plain text password authenticator to the client. And when the client sends back the username and password, it essentially uses that to attempt to log into an LDAP instance. This is like a very common approach with LDAP authentication is the service will attempt to authenticate as the, as the principal. And if it succeeds, uh, I can't remember if the, the LDAP plugin does roles based on that, but essentially just being able to authenticate says that you are who you say you are. Um, there's also a Kerberos plugin, uh, but it's, it's Java only. Kerberos is a distributed authentication framework, uh, essentially allows you to uh, authenticate. Uh, it's kind of a single sign-on approach where you authenticate once to a, a ticket granting server. You have a ticket, which is basically um, it's an assertion. It says you are who you say you are. It says it has a lifetime. It's valid for X amount of time. And when you authenticate to the server, you hand that ticket and the server can use that ticket to validate you are who you say are with the, with the, the, the key server. Um, we also have SIG v4. Uh, this is uh, a plugin that we developed and open sourced here uh, uh, for Amazon key spaces. Um, SIG v4 is a, a digest based authentication protocol. So um, to compare the, the plain text uh, authentication implementation in Cassandra passes it uh, as part of like a SASL plain text mechanism, which means that it passes it in plain text. So if you're going to use the plain text authenticator, it's, you probably want to turn on uh, TLS encryption for your client connections. Um, with SIGV4, it's, it's, it's a digest mechanism, which basically says that uh, we don't actually tr transmit credentials. What we do is we use the credentials to create a signature or a digest that can then be transmitted between the two sides. And the, the server can basically perform uh, the exact same digest creation and compare them to make sure that they match up. 
Um, Sigv4 also has some things like it has lifetime, so you can specify how long the the uh, the credentials are valid for, in which case that becomes part of the signature, so you can't spoof that. You can also put in the host name, so you can't take credentials that have been used for one system and use it for another. But really, this is about making it uh, easy uh, for for uh, our customers to, to interact with us. Um, so let's talk a little bit about authentication in CQLSH. Um, CQLSH is hard coded to only support the password authenticator. So uh, you can see this is this is a snippet of code from the CQLSH source. Basically, um, if you specify a username, uh, and you can do this either with a flag on the command line, or you can specify it in the CQLSHRC file, but um, if you specify a username, it assumes that you're going to use the plain text auth provider and it will use that um, to, to authenticate. So that means if, if you have on your server um, enabled, say, Kerberos, uh, then you, you can use that with the drivers because the drive, there is a, well, at least with Java drivers, you can, you, there's a plugin that you could use that with the Java drivers, but you won't be able to use CQLSH anymore because when we do that authentication exchange between the client and the server, uh, they're not going to agree. The server is going to say, I'm using Kerberos and CQLS, CQLS, uh, CQLSH is going to say, actually, I only know about the password authenticator and it'll basically fail. Um, in the case of the LDAP provider, like I said, it, it appears to the client to be the password authenticator. So CQLSH will still work with LDAP. And with SIGV4, what we've done is we, we essentially leverage the exchange uh, because if you remember, the client has an opportunity to send back an auth response. So what we do in SIGV4 is the server will initially say that it's the plain text auth provider. But if you have configured the SIGV4 plugin on the client side, it will attempt uh, to send back a SIGV4 uh, authentication message that says instead of using a username and password basically says, I want to use SIG before. And then the server, when it sees that initial response, then it goes through the whole handshake, it passes the nonce back and forth, things like that. So there are ways that we can uh, leverage the protocol to give a, ourselves some flexibility, but uh, in CQLSH itself, there's still, um, there's still some limitations. So let's talk a little bit about a use case that we've encountered. Um, uh, in, in Amazon key spaces that I think is, is, is something that, uh, is generalizable to the, to the Cassandra community at large. Um, and that is we're, we're using ephemeral credentials. Um, ephemeral credentials are, uh, a way to create short lived, uh, uh, authentication material that's kind of generated on demand. Um, and the idea here is, uh, you know, whether or not you're rotating constantly or whether you, you just generate one every time you need a request, it's something where once the credential has been used, it has a limited lifetime, it can't be used again. So this is um, a way to kind of mitigate compromise. So even if someone were somehow able to get hold of my credentials right now, they wouldn't be valid in say an hour or a day or whatever lifetime I want on it. Um, Kerberos tickets are somewhat of an example um, because I've logged in, I've generated a Kerberos ticket uh, that I have locally and I can use that, but it has an expiration and you can't use it beyond that time. Um, in, in Amazon key spaces, uh, we have, uh, we leverage what's called uh, EC2 instance profiles or Lambda execution profiles or another one of these where um, if you have an EC2 instance, or if you have a Lambda that's that's going to execute a Lambda function, um, there's a mechanism by which these ephemeral credentials are essentially associated with that instance or with that function. And so what happens is your application, uh, when it runs, it it knows as part of the, the plugin that it can look up locally this instance role, which basically says, um, I'm going to assume this role temporarily. Uh, that gives you the ephemeral credentials 
that then you use to do a SIG v4 signature and you can access key spaces. Um, so there are a couple of things happening here. One, it's ephemeral credentials, which, which we think is, is more secure, or which I think is more secure. Um, the other is uh, it's, it's kind of like a single sign-on system where you don't have to deal with distribution of credentials. You don't need to worry about where credentials are stored, what's going on with them. Um, because essentially the instance role takes care of that for you. And this is gonna be true of any single sign-on system. I'm gonna give an example a little bit later of a, of a SAML system that we could use for this. Um, but the idea is the same. You have, you have a system that deals with identity and authentication and, and credential material that is outside of your application is kind of managed for you. And that's really, um, that's a situation that we want to make easier for, for people. Like as a Cassandra community, we should be looking for ways that we can make it easier for people to uh, simplify security while still maintaining high standards and security. So let's talk a little bit about uh, CQLSH because like I said, when we use plugins that are not the plain text auth provider, that prevents CQLSH from, from working with our, with our instance. So the CEP itself, we talk about what already exists, okay? Um, like I said, the drivers, uh, all the official drivers support pluggable authentication. Um, and CQLSH uses the official Python drivers. Um, CQLSH RC also has a general config parser. So these are some things that we can leverage. Uh, you know, most of what we need is already there. It's, it's more a matter of, of plumbing it through. So the first thing is we need to select the authenticator. Um, in, you know, when, if we're using the driver directly, we can do this programmatically or we can use a configuration file uh, to do this. So we need to have something comparable for CQLSH to be able to specify things. So what we're, what we're suggesting is we can add a new section to the CQLSH RC file uh, I'm going to just call it the RC file because I'm going to keep tripping over that name as we go. Um, but this is this would be the auth provider class, okay? And and so this allows us to specify the class name of our of our provider from from CQLSH's side uh, because it's Python. We we have a path to the module, which is the module name, and then we need a path to the actual Python lib. Uh, so we need to know where on the file system we can load this uh, so we can use import lib to pull in the, uh, the new class and we can instantiate it. We can then use it uh, as part of our authentication exchange. Um, additionally, uh, in the RC, uh, it's, it's not uncommon that the uh, authenticator class is gonna need some additional configuration. Um, this could be everything from specifying a configuration file to perhaps we have some specific parameters that we want to do. Um, and the idea here is we have another section called auth provider class extended properties that defines key value pairs that are passed as arguments to the constructor for the plugin. Um, you know, as an example, if we are setting up Kerberos, uh, we would need to know what our, what our realm is that we're, that we're actually a member of. Uh, we might also need to know like where where we need to look for uh, tickets or we might allow people to override, say, the location of knit or other Kerberos tools so that we can utilize those. Um, so if we if we if we put that together. You know, as an example, we have let's say we have this uh, hypothetical SAML auth provider and we say that it's com example Cassandra driver auth. And it's located in our home directory under the SAML plugin uh, subdirectory. Now, SAML uh, is a little, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's complicated, but it's not a trivial thing to set up. So we, we might want a configuration file here that allows us to specify certain properties about how our client is going to work. Um, and and this, this basically is the configuration file. We also would need to do work in CQLSH itself to utilize these, to load things in. Um, like, I, like I said earlier, right now it's hard coded to be password authenticator. So we would need to make that a little bit more flexible so that it looks at the configuration to decide whether or not it's going to use um, the, the plain text auth provider or a user specified auth provider or no auth provider. Um, the logic would have to change a little bit there, but that seems like a fairly straightforward thing uh, 
uh, for us to do as a community. So I mentioned SAML. SAML. Um, for anybody that's that's been around a while, uh, SAML is more commonly uh, brought up in terms of uh, website interactions. Um, basically, SAML is a an authentication framework, um, and there are, there are three actors uh, in an exchange here. So there's the client, which in our case is going to be CQLSH. Um, there is the service provider, which is basically the client needs to connect to a service provider and authenticate. So a service provider in our example is Cassandra. And then there's the identity provider. And the identity provider is really the, the um, it's the component that deals with the authentication and assertions and all these things that say, yes, this, this client is logged in as who they say they are. You can go ahead and let them in. Um, but what SAML really comes down to is an exchange of XML messages. Um, it's actually it's actually a SOAP uh, based protocol, um, and the messages are signed, uh, which is is used to to help uh, prove they are who they say they are. Uh, interestingly, the way that SAML is defined, they're they're what are called bindings, and uh, the HTTP binding for SAML basically uses the client, which in traditional SAML would be your web browser. It uses the client as a kind of a proxy or a man in the middle between the service provider and the identity provider. So if you look at the actual SAML spec, um, the idea is when, when the client connects to the service provider, the service provider sends back uh, a, a redirect or a post to the client that then the client interprets and executes and that post or redirect sends it to the identity provider and the identity provider does the same thing where it sends back an XML form that then when submitted actually posts to the, the service provider. It's, it's, a, it's a very 2005 <laughs> approach to things, um, but it works. Uh, so, but the, the, big, the important part is that's, that's the mechanism that's defined for it, but really the core of it is these XML messages that move back and forth. So how could we use this in Cassandra? So, well, obviously CQLSH is not a web browser, um, nor should it be, but the plugin would need to be responsible for at least understanding and mimicking some aspects of, um, of this exchange. And so we modify our, uh, you know, we don't modify the, the CQL protocol, but we'll use a, a slightly modified exchange to make this work. So the idea would be if we if we issue a startup uh, and Cassandra is uh, configured to use a SAML auth provider, it would say, okay, you need to authenticate with SAML auth provider. Now, because, uh, because of the way SAML works, it's actually the service provider that initiates the authentication request, not the client. And so our auth response is basically an empty message. It, it doesn't really need to be anything. Um, so we send that back to the Cassandra server. Cassandra can then send us an auth challenge. And this uses the, the SAML P authentic request, which is going to be a, an XML document. Um, in the actual spec, they say it's going to be a base 64 encoded version of this XML document. And it's sent back as like a CGI post variable. Uh, in an XML form. Um, also, in the whole scenario here, the client does not determine the identity provider, the Cassandra server does. And the reason there is really, you have to have a trust set up between the service provider and the identity provider. So Cassandra will only trust certain IDPs. And, uh, and so it knows which one it wants to talk to. So as part of our auth challenge, we're gonna send back this auth end request and we're gonna send you a URL of which IDP to talk to. And the plugin in CQLSH essentially then says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best impression of a web browser and I'll go ahead and send this auth end re request over to the IDP. The IDP sends back, it's literally a SAML P response is the name of the message um, and that that essentially uh, provides a whole bunch of things like who, the identity of the user, because that's not actually something that the client tells Cassandra. It's something that the client negotiates with the identity provider. Um, 
basically sends identity, sends a signature on that. It can send limitations like not before, not after timestamps that you can use to limit access. Um, and then the, the, the driver, the, the plugin on CQLSH would then also need to make an auth response back and send back this response to, uh, to Cassandra, which can then evaluate the response, compare signatures uh, with the certificate that it has for the identity provider, make sure that that's valid, and then either return an auth successor error. So a little bit more complicated than, than a plain text. Um, most of the complication here actually just comes from the fact that we're going to emulate a web browser. We have to make these HTTP calls on one side of CQLSH. So, um, but from a user standpoint, uh, you, you can do things like single sign on another identity. Um, the, the trick might be, uh, depending on the IDP, CQLSH might need to open a local web browser if it needs to authenticate the user. Um, that's where things get a little bit more involved in the actual plugin itself. But um, that's not an absolute requirement of handle. It just needs to be able to, to do this exchange. So yeah, so some minor wrinkles with this. It's defined for HTTP bindings. We're going to have to go back and forth with all these, uh, the XML forms and post. Uh, like I said, it definitely feels like a solution uh, from 2005, you know, I think it's a good example of doing the best with the tools you have at the time. Um, if we if we look to slightly more modern alternatives, um, there is OAuth 2.0. Uh, they do ex expressly call it out for authorization only. I, I, I can't remember if the spec explicitly says do not use for authentication, but I think it, it, it definitely says out of scope a lot in the document. Um, but OpenID Connect is a slightly newer uh, layer on top of OAuth 2.0 um, that is meant to be an identity layer. And so that, that means it's meant to be something that uh, proves you are who you say you are and kind of transitively that proves that you authenticated as who you say you are. And then you, you have trust then between the, the service provider and the identity provider. Um, and then there's Kerberos, right? Kerberos has been around for a really long time. Um, you know, it's it's a long-standing Unix standard. If you're using Windows, you're really using a, a modified version of Kerberos under the hood for authentication. Um, it already exists on the server. Uh, the main thing is it only has a Java Python, or I'm sorry, a Java driver. It we need a Python driver. It could extend it for other uh, languages potentially. Um, but that's, that's already one that, that is there. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the plug inside what we can do with the existing framework. What are some other things uh, that we can do uh, to help improve the, the security posture for Cassandra, make it easier for our operators to secure their systems, make it easier for, for, um, for end users to, to be secure in their interactions with Cassandra? Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities here uh, for the community to, to, to build uh, more tools, to improve existing tooling. Um, obtaining credentials. So this is, I think this is a pretty simple one to, to, to talk about. So in CQLSH, you can specify the username in, on the command line with the, with the flag, you can specify in CQLSHRC. Um, if you don't specify a password in either of those places, it will prompt for it uh, using get pass. So that's that's a secure means of input. Um, but there are some there are some problems, uh, or or maybe problem isn't the right word, but there are some things that could be done better here. Um, so the first is if you're using command line arguments, um, your command line arguments are visible in the process list. So if I specified, you know, minus P and some password in, in my in my CQLSH to connect, um, other people on the same system are gonna be able to see that. So that's, that's not good. Um, additionally, if you have any kind of auditing service where you're, you're logging invocations of tools, uh, you know, checking to see what people are running, It'll, it'll likely get captured uh, in those logs. And so then you'll have credentials in the logs, which is usually not a good thing. Um, in a similar vein, 
uh, the RC file, it's, it's really convenient to not have to type out your credentials, right? If I'm always using the same credentials, um, then I could just put it in the, in the RC file and I don't have to remember it and put it on the command line every time. But, um, CQLSH doesn't check your, your, uh, file permissions, right? It doesn't say, uh, you know, you left your, your file world readable. And so if you, if you forget to do it, um, it's also possible for people on a shared system to potentially be able to, to look at your credentials that way. So how can we make this um, easier? Uh, well, well, one part of it is uh, gathering credentials is something that is probably going to be common across a variety of plugins, right? Uh, the plain text one definitely uses it. Um, I can envision other uh, layers that might need to use it. It'd be good to have a, a common way to do this. And uh, make sure that when we're prompting for input or reading from SQL SHRC that we do some, some simple checks. Well, even better is just to inform. Um, this would be pretty simple as to, you know, we don't, we can't remove the minus P flag. I can certainly see use cases where you would have this, but um, just having a warning or something where you could, you could let users know that when they they specify it on the on the command line that you can you could possibly be divulging your credentials. Similarly, um, we might want to validate file security. Uh, so we could say the file's world readable, um, and you might want to check this. Uh, and it's 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 two parts. I think I think effective messaging is is part informing and part helping someone figure out what to do. So. Uh, may, like I said, making it easy to do the right thing. You might tell, you might even tell somebody, you know, if you want to secure this file, you can issue this command, right? And 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 then they can just they can issue that and um, change modes. But um, you know, credentials files uh, and CQLSHRC, uh, I, I think it's a conflation of of different aspects because one is just the general configuration of CQLSH. Like you can specify a lot of different things in there, like default key spaces, all these things. Um, and then credentials are really how you access it. And the 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 security or the sensitivity that you ascribe to those different things is is different. And so I actually think we could uh, you know uh, an improvement we could make uh, to CQLSH would be to allow it to to separate those out. Um, so we already can read any files. That's really easy. So if we just set the, set it so that you have a, a say a minus minus credentials flag, or if it would look for, def, you know, by default for a credentials file, uh, in the users.cassandra or wherever they specified their base directory, um, that would, that would easily allow them to do that. Um, I've worked in places before where there was a shared SQL SHRC because it had certain settings that were common across a bunch of people. And this is, this is a mechanism by which we can kind of have our cake and eat it too, right? We could have a shared SQL SHRC that specifies all the common things for the cluster that we're working with, make sure that, you know, uh, you know, so if we're in a test environment, it makes sure that we're always connecting to the test cluster, you know, you can specify things like that but would then allow each user to have their own per user credentials separated out. Um, so this is, this is something we've been talking about. We might, um, I don't think we'll do it as part of the current CEP, but certainly we, we may propose another CEP to follow this one up. Um, and then, you know, another, another thing that's, that's even more modern than OAuth and uh, SAML would be U2F and, and other multi-factor authentication. Um, and the idea here is that you have strength in additional factors. Um, it's it's what you know and what you have. Commonly, these are either software tokens uh, or hardware tokens. Um, they do operate in different modes. Um, some some tokens, most tokens I've worked with, um, allow you to do a, a one-time password or OTP mode. Uh, and these are actually really easy to integrate with with things that um, use. Uh, like plain text auth. So like the, the default plain text auth implementation would actually work really well with this because the idea of a one-time password is that it can only be used once and then it can't be used again. So that's that's like the the most ideal uh, ephemeral credential is, is a one-time use uh, credential. 
Um, but the, the, the mode here is essentially you have your own pin and uh, then you have the one-time password that goes with the pin and you uh, send that um, to the server and the server can essentially calculate your OTP. These are either time-based or there are a couple different ways that this can happen, but it, it does a, a comparison of the two. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it'll record the, 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 the password that was used and it keeps a window of the last several ones used. Sometimes OTPs are only valid for, say, like a 30 second window. And so, um, you know, that's another way that you prevent it from being reused. Uh, so different things can happen there. Um, I, I have worked with one MFA device. This was a while ago, so I don't know if this is still that common, but it was a non OTP mode. This was, um, this was a mode essentially where the client needed to interact with the hardware itself. Um, and the idea there was if you think of the whole exchange where you're sending credential material to the server and the server can send back a challenge, the way that these modes work is um, when you send that initial response, the server will generate some sort of credential challenge material and send it to the client. And the idea is the client then needs to hand it to the hardware and the hardware can do some sort of cryptographic or other security based um, transformation of that data. And its response then gets handed to the client. The client sends that back. So it's not as simple as an OTP. I mean, a lot of these OTP devices, they look like a, like a keyboard to the computer. And so when you hold down the button or you press a button or do something, um, it just spits out a bunch of characters. But in non-OTP modes, um, it's a little more complicated than that. Like I said, fortunately, uh, most of the MFA devices I've worked with can do OTP mode, and that would be a pretty simple one to integrate. Um, the other thing that uh, that would also allow is potentially uh, that allows an easier migration path. If you're if you're currently using password based authentication, um, you could build a server side plugin that would either you know based on the format of what it got back as username and password um, would either use the you know, would either use the internal database for plain text auth or could use the, the OTP authenticator for the MFA. So a lot of opportunities there. Um, these are these are some interesting ideas we've been uh, kind of kicking around. Um, so if you're interested or you have some ideas around this, I'd love to chat after the session. OK, so um, key takeaways, uh, the existing authentication mechanism mechanism uh, in CTLSH is, is just for plain text. Um, if you want to use something else on the server, it's going to preclude your use of, of CQLSH, uh, which is kind of a, a bummer because CQLSH is a nice tool for interacting with your cluster. Um, there are existing use cases for author other authenticators. Um, you know, uh, if you want to improve the security of your system right now and you, and you want to use CQLSH, that intersection is really just plain text auth. Um, and I think we can do better. Uh, the drivers already support the plugins, so it's it's not a big jump to go from where we are now to to having CQLS H be more friendly with with the authenticators can use. Um, and then even beyond just the pluggable authentication implementation, I think there are a number of things that we could do to help improve the security posture. Uh, you know, like I said, be more informative for users when they're doing things that could potentially be insecure separate out the credentials file. You know, that's a really easy change that would make it very simple for people to, to better secure their credentials. And then the long term, um, you know, how can we how can we accommodate future security mechanisms? And just as importantly, um, what are things that, that we can do as a community to help the migration path right now? Because of the situation where both sides have to agree, um, you kind of have to uh, migrate your client and server at the same time in lockstep. Um, and that can be tricky. I mean, in, in a lot of cases that is gonna involve some sort of outage or you know maintenance window where you're kind of fiddling with everything all at once. It'd be nicer if we were able to, to have some sort of negotiation uh, or interchange that allows you to kind of incre increment one side and not the other, but not break things. So I think there, there's some interesting aspects to consider there. Um, for further reading, if you're interesting, interested, uh, we have the CEP open, Cassandra 16456. Um, and then as an example of a, a client-side plugin, we have the, um, the, the Python driver plugin for SIGV4 uh, is up on GitHub. Uh, 
Um, we also have it for other languages. It's up for I think Python, Node, Go, and uh, Java right now. Um, and we'll add more as needed. And uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank everyone for attending the session. Uh, Derek, we just had one question about PKI logins. What, is that in the CEP? PKI, PKI logins? Yes. Um, I would I would need to better understand what we mean by PKI there. So, Claude, Claude, um, if you have more context, you drop in the chat window. Those happy to take yes. it. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I'm looking at the Q and A window, and it's not. Um, oh wait, it's in the chat window. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, certificate based off, it looks like. Okay. Um, PKI logins. Let's. Log in using a public key. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. If there's a if there's a plugin for that, um, we could do it. I mean, there is there is uh, SSL based certificate authentication. Is that what you mean, Claude? Or are you thinking of something else? I'm not. Okay. Yeah. So that is also an option. Is you can. Um, I'm, I'm not that familiar. I think what, what you could do is essentially the, uh, the Cassandra server can be set up so that it authenticates or validates the, uh, the client certificate that comes in as part of the SSL or TLS exchange. So yeah, that's also an option. Cool. I think that does it for the questions. You know, again, thank you very much for attending the session today, Derek. I learned a lot as always. Um, you know, if you have any questions for us, please reach out. I think our emails are here somewhere. Otherwise, we're on Twitter. Um, you know, you, you, you can find us. Yeah, I'll be hanging around in the. I'll be looking at some other sessions today, so I'll be I'll be around. Uh, you know, feel free to drop me a line, chat. Um, always always interested to talk about security. <laughs>